Thank you very much. Right, well, good morning, everyone. Yes, it's a slight change of, uh, of uh, topic. And apologies for in your programs, the slightly different title, but I want to talk about this new emerging uh, field of science. Uh, so I'm going to, so it's a 15 minutes tutorial, not just in quantum mechanics, but how it's being applied in, in, in biology. And asking the question of whether life itself d relies on quantum mechanics. It's just one of the, still, the biggest mysteries in science. What is it that distinguishes living matter from inanimate matter of equivalent complexity? And, you know, we've gone beyond sort of vitalism and, and sort of magic pixie dust that sort of sprinkles life onto, onto uh, organic chemistry and turns, turns chemistry into biology, but maybe we're starting to see hints of, of, of an answer. So um, let me first talk you through what is quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics, uh, as dis differentiating it from what's called classical mechanics, which is what Isaac Newton taught us, the mechanics of uh, balls, um, cannons firing balls, um, forces and momentum and energy, the sort of physics that you learn at school. Quantum mechanics is a new kind of physics developed back in the 1920s that applies down at the subatomic scale. So if you look at, if we sort of go down in orders of magnitude and size, start with something uh, of the size of everyday objects like a tennis ball, we can calculate very accurately, using the equations New that Newton gave us, equations of motion, how a tennis ball moves, how it spins, how it bounces, and, and, and so on. But as you get smaller and smaller, you get down to the level of, of cells and beyond, all the way down to the atomic scale, at some point, those equations that Newton taught us completely break down, and we enter this fuzzy world of probability where particles can be in two places at once, they're also spread out waves, very counterintuitive, very mysterious, and yet hugely successful. Quantum mechanics, well, I, you know, I would say this, I'm a physicist, but I would say it's the most successful theory in all of science. Without quantum mechanics, we wouldn't have modern physics, we wouldn't have any chemistry. We wouldn't understand so much. We wouldn't have all the technology. We wouldn't be talking about AI because we wouldn't have computers, because we wouldn't have silicon chips, because we wouldn't have understood what a semiconductor is and how electrons move through material. So underpinning so much of modern technology is quantum mechanics. Um, the, the problem is, you see, that I've, I've highlighted the nanometer. A nanometer is a billionth of a meter. That's the scale where quantum effects start to kick in. That's also the scale where we're dealing with the, the building blocks of life, molecules like DNA. Now, my expertise in terms of research throughout my career has been studying the nucleus of the atom how the protons and neutrons inside the nucleus arrange themselves. So that's the playground of quantum mechanics. But there's this region where the classical world, the Newtonian world, becomes the quantum world that we're still trying to figure out whether or not ha has a boundary, has a border. One has to turn into the other. But it's the area where we're dealing with the molecules of life. So the question is, how come biologists or molecular biologists, when they're dealing with the, the mechanisms inside living cells, down at the level of DNA and proteins, how come they've not been worried about quantum mechanics? Well, physicists have found quantum mechanics tremendously successful. This is an iconic picture of the Atlas detector. This is one of the, the giant cameras, essentially, at the Large Hadron Collider in CERN in Geneva. And you can see, for scale, the engineer standing in front. This is a giant camera. Basically, almost counterintuitively, the smaller you want to figure out the building blocks of matter, the bigger the machine you have to build, because the harder you've got to smash things together. Um, that all arose in the success of physics, leading to, for example, all the particles of nature, all the particles of the universe having been discovered, is all down to quantum mechanics. So dividing this picture into two, all the stuff on your left, those are all the particles that have been discovered, including the blue, the Higgs boson, the most recent one. It completed the picture. We now think there may be a whole other mirror universe of particles called supersymmetric particles that the Large Hadron Collider is looking for. They've gone rather quiet, you might have noticed, in the last few years, because they haven't found any. So maybe we're wrong. But physics throughout the 20th century and into the 21st has been successful based on quantum mechanics. Chemistry as well has been successful. The periodic table of elements on every um, school lab wall in the world, which goes back to Mendeleev in the 19th century, 
we now only understand why the elements arrange themselves, how we can classify their properties in this way because of quantum mechanics, because that gives us the rules of how electrons arrange themselves around atoms. Uh, and by the way, you might notice lots of um, elements that you've never even heard of. The one here, 118 OG, that's the most recent chemical element to be discovered. It stands for Oganesson, which is named after a Russian nuclear physicist, Yuri Oganesian. It's the only element named after a living human being. Just an aside, there's about a dozen elements named after people, Einsteinium, Curium, and so on. But Yuri Oganesian is alive and well. So, all down to quantum mechanics. Now, however, I'm, I'm, I'm showing you a cover of my book, but um, it's not a pitch to buy the book because it's, it's a different edition now and that cover doesn't exist anymore. The reason I, I'm showing you this is because, as I mentioned in the introduction, quantum mechanics may be successful, but at its heart is this mystery. How? How can the world be like this? You know, you explain quantum mechanics to, to, to a layperson, they say, come on, that's, you're just making it up now. You're just you're having, you're having a laugh. Go back and think about it a bit more carefully and come back when you've got some logic. Um, but that, it's, it's good. If you, if you think you understand, if you think, oh, I see, I get it. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's how the particle behaves. No, then you clearly haven't because it is mysterious. You are, it is meant to give you a headache. Well, biologists... Uh, so this is, this is my, my favorite cartoon of what quantum mechanics is all about, okay? The quantum skier. Now, the tree looks fine. He looks like he could father children. Uh, there's no reason why not. And yet, if you were to see this, you think, no, well, you know, see it on YouTube, but there's clearly some, some trick going on. Well, that's what happens in the quantum world. Particles are able to go in two directions at once. They can be in two places at once in a way that really just defies logic. Biologists however, have been very successful thus far with their balls and sticks models of molecules, all very classical. There's no quantum mechanics beyond how the, you know, the bonds that hold atoms together subject to certain rules. It's not, there's no real sort of fuzzy, weird quantum mechanics going on in biology. And that's mainly because biology or molecular biology and genetics grew and, and evolved at the same time as quantum mechanics in the 1920s and 30s. And it's been tremendously successful. If you think of the advances that have been made in biology and genetic engineering, for example, and gene editing, incredible. But they don't need quantum mechanics. So how come? <laughs> They're dealing with atoms, right? They're dealing with these fuzzy things that physicists and chemists know are quantum mechanical. So why, why is it not uh, around in biology? Well, to some extent, we could say uh, if quantum physics is the foundation of all of the building blocks of the universe, then quantum physics will explain organic chemistry. Okay? That's just atoms stuck together. Organic chemistry, scaled up in complexity, gives us molecular biology, which is life. So in a sense, you could say, well, if quantum mechanics plays a role, then it's not surprising it plays a role in biology, because quantum, you, know, you zoom down deep enough, small enough, and you will hit the quantum domain. So there must be quantum effects. Don't go inventing whole new areas of science just to get more research funding to make it sound sexier. Um, that's not what quantum biology is about. Okay, so I want to talk you through why we now are starting to believe that there's something else going on in biology that biologists need to take more notice of. It goes back to a book written by Erwin Schrodinger. If, you've heard of, if you're not a physicist and you've heard of Schrodinger, it's probably because of his famous cat in the box that's dead and alive at the same time until you open the box. This is a paradox that he highlighted in the 1930s. He's one of the founders of quantum mechanics, and yet he comes up with this paradox because he can't get his head around what he's discovered. So he, he, he just finds it crackers. He said, but how? If, an at if, cat, if a cat is made of atoms, and atoms behave like they can do two things at once, then that means the cat should also be dead and alive at the same time if I put it in a box with some poison that has a 50-50 chance of killing the cat. Until I open the box and check, the cat's in what's called a superposition of being dead and alive at the same time. It's in a fuzzy in-between reality that, that exists in both. And quantum physicists have found many ways of trying to make sense of that argument. One of the most popular, for example, is called the many worlds theory, which is that when you, the cat is indeed dead and alive, and when you open the box, the universe splits in two. The universe in which you open the box and find the cat, say, alive, you know, phew, there's another you in another universe that's found the cat dead. And this is a serious 
interpretation of what's going on. A large fraction of physicists, including people like the late Stephen Hawking, believed that was the way to explain what's going on in the quantum world. Well, Schrodinger, in the 1940s, he escaped Nazi Germany, he went, he settled in Ireland, and he wrote this book called What is Life? And that was the first book that questioned whether quantum mechanics plays a role in life. And he asked this question, so how are living systems so ordered? You know, why are we, you know, we're sort of like steam engines, you know, you've got to have food, you've got to have some fuel, and that allows you to, to be, live and, and do stuff, and, and, and you know, mechanically. Uh, uh, but we're not like steam engines, right? We're not just thermodynamic chaos, we are ordered systems. We maintain this order, what we call in physics, low entropy. And where does that come from? How do we distinguish inanimate from animate matter? And he wonders whether quantum effects kick in at some point. Well, that was in 1944. Nothing much happened in quantum biology, although that book um, influenced people like um, uh, Crick and Watson, who discovered the double helix structure of DNA. Biologists, by and large, left quantum mechanics far behind. Only in the last decade or so have there been experiments showing that certain uh, uh, um, phenomena and mechanisms inside living cells seem to only work because of quantum mechanics. It became very exciting to the extent that uh, a colleague of mine, John Joe McFadden, and I wrote what is still, I think, the only book on quantum, quantum biology in the world, uh, although the physicist Paul Davis has got a new book coming out next year, um, where we speculate. We say, okay, so there are experiments that say photosynthesis, how plants capture sunlight, that requires a bit like the cartoon of the quantum skier going both ways, the lump of energy, the lump of sunlight, the photon, follows multiple routes simultaneously inside the cell. That's the only way we can explain the efficiency of photosynthesis. So there's quantum mechanics going on there. Enzymes seem to be able to transfer particles from one place to another instantaneously uh, in what's called quantum tunneling. Uh, and, and without that quantum tunneling, they wouldn't, enzymes wouldn't be able to do the job they do, which is to catalyze and speed up all the chemical reactions that go on inside living cells. Without these workhorses of, of life, enzymes, there would be no life. And one of the tricks in their armory is to use quantum mechanics. There are other more speculative suggestions. So that, for example, there is the idea that quantum mechanics explains consciousness. You know, consciousness is mysterious. But this notion that well, consciousness, consciousness is mysterious, you don't really understand it, Quantum mechanics is mysterious, we don't understand it, therefore the two must be connected in some way. That's not how you do science. But we, you know, we talk about you know, that, that speculative idea in the book. But um, if we think about what quantum biology requires, it's not just the quantum rules that tell us how electrons order themselves, how atoms fit together to make uh, molecules, the, the, the chemical bonds. They sort of rely, rely on quantum mechanics. But quantum biology is about this, the weirder aspects, what we call non-trivial quantum effects in life. Uh, and so it, requi it requires things like quantum coherence, so a particle behaving like a wave rather than a, a sort of pinpoint particle. So, you know, a, an electron or a proton, you can't say it's a tiny little ball over there orbiting around an atom like a miniature solar system. It's a fuzzy, spread out cloud of probability. That quantum coherence is an effect that we in the physics lab see all the time, but we don't expect to see it inside uh, living cells. And that's because it's very delicate. And any slight disturbance to your quantum system destroys that coherence, makes that wave collapse down to a particle. And we work very hard in physics labs to maintain the quantum effects. You, you cool your apparatus down to near absolute zero. You, you, um, uh, you protect it from surrounding environment. You conduct your experiments in a vacuum. Uh, and even then, you know, before, you know, you just saw a slight puff and the quantum effects have disappeared. So how do they maintain themselves in the busy, noisy, warm, complex environment of a living cell with thousands of chemical reactions going on, lots of particles bumping into each other? Quantum superposition, the idea that two, two waves can, can interact and interfere with each other. Um, uh, quantum tunneling, the particle can move through a force field, through an energy barrier, the equivalent of a phantom gliding through a solid wall. Right? We don't believe in magic, okay? But in the quantum world, that sort of thing happens all the time. In fact, quantum tunneling is the reason the sun shines, because that's how protons fuse together to make helium and how, uh, how the sun derives its energy. Uh, and then even there's something called quantum entanglement, which is 
the weirdest, the most ridiculously, Einstein hated it. Einstein called it spooky action at a distance. He, he thought it was not, and yet we see quantum entanglement all the time. That's the idea where you have two separated particles in space that could instantaneously communicate with each other. And what really bugs me is the Deepak Chopra fans in this world immediately assume something like entanglement can explain, you know, oh, that's how twins are telepathic, you see, or that will explain homeopathy. No, no, those are nonsense things, those are not science but it doesn't make entanglement any less mysterious. So one of the examples of how entanglement plays a role in biology is that it, uh, it, it describes the way certain animals migrate during the winter. So the European robin that lives in uh, uh, northern Europe, in Scandinavia and, and, and Siberia, every autumn, it uh, migrates down to the Mediterranean to look for warmer climates. Um, it's not like the, 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 the British robin is sedentary. It stays in that country all year round, which is why we have it representing Christmas. But the European robin migrates, and um, the way it navigates, we know when animals navigate around the world, there are all sorts of different techniques and tricks they use. And um, some have, you know, map of the stars, you know, sort of the, the, the ingrained and, and memorized. Uh, some follow their sense of smell uh, or prevailing winds. The European robin seems to be able to uh, f f use the Earth's magnetic field to find its directional information. And so the, you know, we know that the Earth has a magnetic The Earth's like a giant bar magnet. It's very weak. But it turns out that some animals, like the European robin, are able to utilize that trick. And so it has some sort of a built-in compass that allows it to gain directional information. Well, that was discovered by uh, two German ornithologists, the Wilchkos, in the 1970s. And even then, it was, even that was seen as sort of almost crazy pseudoscience. How, how can... Uh, you know, okay, you stick yourself in an MRI scanner with very powerful magnetic fields, you could imagine uh, that it would have an effect. But the Earth's magnetic field, well, it turns out they do. They would capture these birds in mid-migration, in nets. They put them in these funnel-type contraptions with an ink pad at the bottom and blotting paper around the side, uh, and then they cover the, uh, the, the uh, you know, trap the birds inside there. And the birds would try and escape so they get ink on their feet and then clamber up the side, wanting to f move in the direction that their ma magnetic compass tells them to go. So they preferentially are choosing to go south. Um, what they then do is they, they put magnetic coils in the lab that are the opposite polarity to the Earth's magnetic field. So where the Earth's north magnetic field, they put a south and the south to north, and they cancel out the Earth's magnetic field. So as far as those robins are concerned, there is no magnetic field any longer and they just fly off in all random directions. So they've proved beyond any doubt that they use a compass, but no one really knew, or indeed still doesn't know for sure, how that compass works. The only theory that would explain it is, and it sort of sounds a bit wacky, he says, having just criticized Deepak Chopra, um, that the, uh, inside the bird's eye, inside the retina, is a protein called cryptochrome. And inside this protein, two electrons are quantum entangled. So these are two particles uh, that are, you know, one does something, the other one knows what it's, what's going on. And they sit on different parts of this protein molecule. And they, they spin. They, they dance, a sort of dance while uh, separated. And what one does affects the way the other one behaves. And that delicate dance is very sensitive to the orientation in the Earth's magnetic field. And so where the, the bird points affects how those electrons behave. And in turn, they um, kick in some signal that this protein sends to the bird's brain, telling it what direction it should fly. We don't know if that's how this comp magnetic compass works inside uh, um, the robin. We think it's definitely inside the robin's eye because they've done experiments by putting sort of some sort of uh, like an executioner's mask on top of the bird's eyes. And, and again, it, it's not just blind, but it doesn't get magnetic information either. It would just be so cool if 
quantum entanglement, this, this idea in quantum mechanics that even Einstein hated, that is the reason that the European Robin, Robin can find its, 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 uh, its directional information. It's just one of a number of exciting new areas in quantum biology that may end up explaining how life is the way it is. Thank you very much. Can I just yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much for that. I think you made quantum theory actually understandable. So, well, oh, good. Um, a question. So, uh, as a particle physicist, now suddenly you're looking at how birds behave. You know, how, how does that change in, in your career? How, how did that change happen? Well, it changed very slowly. So, my co author of the book, John Joe McFadden, is a molecular biologist. And we started talking about this about 20 odd years ago. Mm. And it's funny, quantum biology, physicists don't like it because they, biology is messy. It's complicated. True. Uh, biologists don't like it because they don't, they don't know about quantum mechanics. So they, don't, they can't do the maths. The chemists don't like it because they think oh, what, you know, everything's quantum in the end. What's, what's the big fuss about? So it's a tiny group. Um, I'm now talking to chemists, I'm talking to biologists, we've just started a new research centre at my university at Surrey, where we've got PhD students looking into it. I'm having to learn a whole new language sure. to be able to communicate with people in a different field entirely. Do you think that's the future of science in itself, that the, the, you know, as we progress, more and more fields will intersect and, and people will have Abs to... Absolutely. I mean, so the, the people I interview on Radio 4 and the Life Scientific, are invariably people who've come from one field and applied their expertise in another. So, I mean, we've heard a lot already this morning about AI. Mm -hmm. Artificial intelligence is one of those areas that's interdisciplinary. Mathematicians True. and computer scientists and engineers and so on. Um, genetic engineering is another. Uh, neuroscience is another. Uh, so there's lots, the, the most exciting areas of research in the world today are not silo yeah. research uh, fields, they are interdisciplinary. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.